I'm Vern Tobin. Uh, I live at, uh, do you want to know my address? Sure. I live at Homestead at Hickory View. I've lived there for five years. I was born and raised in Washington. What year were you born? 1928, March 14th. That has a bearing on, I think, the questions that you're going to ask about World War II? Yes. Well, you see, I was, uh, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. You go no, ahead. You go, no, you go ahead. Oh, okay. I was born in March, so I was in my senior year of high school and in my final semester. The war was over, but they were still drafting people for the Army of Occupation. Well, if you were in your final semester, you were permitted to finish high school. I was, I received a notice to report for a pre-induction physical examination for the Army on uh, June the 4th. We graduated on June the 2nd, you see, so they didn't waste any time. However, May the 15th, 1946, U.S. Congress canceled the draft, and they talked about a thing called universal military training, which was the same as the draft, except it had a, draft had a kind of a connotation uh, to people being pulled in. At any rate, I was allowed to finish my senior year in high school, and well, everybody thought you, you were going to be going to going to be drafted anyway into the Army of Occupation, and so uh, when my I, I wanted to re enlist and get it over with, but the war was over, and I had probably a dozen cousins who were in the Army during the war, uh, one of whom was severely injured, uh, wounded, and under circumstances would have died, but uh, uh, th that again is another story. Then every one of these cousins would come home and they would not be at their home two days before they'd come to see my dad. My father would write to two of them every week you know, he would alternate. And so these people got more letters from my dad in some cases than they did from their parents. And so they were very grateful. I found out how important letters and, and communication is with your family and friends when you're away. At any rate, my mother would ask them, Vernon wants to enlist, what do you think? To a man, every one of them said, don't let him enlist, he won't like it. If he's gonna be in the army, make him draft him. So she wouldn't give my permission to join the army. I didn't really want to join the army, I preferred to the navy, but never got to any, any of that. So I was not drafted and I did not uh, volunteer. My, uh, my senior year in high school, I won an academic scholarship to St. Louis University. So that was the next option, go to St. Louis University and talk about a scholarship, which I did. And the day I went down there to be interviewed, I was interviewed in a classroom, not too much different than this, and a, a big priest, he must have been six feet five, walked in, a Jesuit, was, if you're not Catholic, that they wear black uh, habits, walked in and I was sitting at the, in the first row and he said, Mr. Tobin, I understand you've come to talk about your scholarship. I said, yes. He said, well now, Mr. Tobin, 
if I put you in that bench, it wasn't just a table, if I put you in that bench, you'll be there for perhaps six to eight weeks, and then you'll be drafted, and that bench will be vacant for the entire semester. I can put a, put a returning GI in that desk, and he'll stay there for the whole semester. So here's another guy talking me out of doing something I, I wanted to do. But I, I took it that way and, and, and uh, went on with my life. I was working at the time in a store, and I enjoyed that. And time went on. No, by the way, 1948 was an election. 19, yeah, 1946. I'm sorry, was an election year. So, no universal training or or draft was was initiated. Uh, it was just let drop. In 1950, when I was 22, my wife and I were married on February 18th. The Korean War started in June of 1950. The first year of that, they didn't draft married men. By the time they got around to drafting married men, we had a son. They didn't draft a fathers. By this time, I've now got three draft cards and I've never even been examined for the service. Then the Korean War ended and I got a fourth draft card. I have four draft cards, everything from 1A to D, and, and I've never been examined for the service. That's why I'm not, I was not in the, in the military. In my graduating class at Borgia in 1946, there's one other uh, male graduate who did not serve in the, in the Army or Navy, and he had emphysema even as a, a child. Had a hard time breathing. You know, emphysema is what smoking does to you, but he was born with that. And he, he, he sit in class and this way he'd breathe. And he was never examined for the service. But every other one of my classmates were either drafted after the war or they were drafted uh, in the Korean War. Now, that's the story of why I wasn't in service. But I, I'll let you ask the question. Did I talk too much about it? No, no, you did good. Okay. What rules or laws did you have to follow because of the war? What rules or laws did you have to follow because of the war? Oh, well, we had a lot of rules. Uh, I don't know, know if you'd call it a, a rule, but when you're 18, you're old enough to drive, and your parents have a car, and occasionally they let you use it. But they only got three gallons of gas a, 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 a week? Yeah, three gallons of gas a week. Now, some people got more than that if they, if they had a, a defense job working someplace in St. Charles County or St. Louis. They got more gasoline to get to and from work. But my father worked at the shoe factory which you don't even remember an operation out on 2nd Street near the park. Well, during the war, the shoe factory manufactured combat boots. Now, uh, you, you can't imagine what that was like unless you saw it. Uh, they had as many people working as they could get. We as high schoolers could go to work from 7 to 8.30 we could come back at 3.30 and work till 5, sometimes till 6. We could work on Saturdays at least a half a day. Sometimes we worked on Sunday when they had a, a big order of, of uh, combat boots. Now, uh, remember, I graduated in 46, but I was working in the shoe factory from the time I was 16 
part time, of course. So I'm, I'm, I hope I'm not confusing you with these years, 44, 46, 40. But uh, uh, let's see, I don't even remember now how I got off on this tangent, but. Uh, uh, Oh yeah, yeah, the gas. Yeah. There wasn't a rule. That's all. It was a law. Yeah. Uh, we had a lot of other things going on during the war, and I'll go back to that. Uh, I remember. This is a little on the side. I remember distinctly when I found out that we were at war. As a uh, thirteen-year-old, I set pins at the bowling alley. Now, you, you don't see that when you go to the bowling alley now. You, that's all automatic. But in those days, you had to get down in that pit behind the uh, alley and put the pins up into the rack. And then, of course, you had to jam it down to make them set straight. And I was working on a Sunday afternoon in the bowling alley, and I heard a very unusual sound. Two young men came up Second Street outside the window. I had the window open, and they were saying, extra, extra, Pearl Harbor bound, extra. We'd never saw an extra of the St. Louis paper. In St. Louis, that was very common for our newsboys to go up and down the street as often as six times a day with different editions of the paper. And they would have the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. They would have the St. Louis Star-Times. The St. Louis Globe Democrat was a morning paper. And, 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 and you could go out and buy a paper, you know? three cents or six cents, I don't remember, it wasn't very much. And, and these, we never did see an extra being sold in Washington. So I listened and I asked them when they came to the window, I said, where's Pearl Harbor? We don't know. I didn't know either. Had to find that out the next day. But the war came on uh, for a teenager who, I suppose I read the sports section and the comic section, but I sure didn't read the front page or, or the editorial page. And so it came on as a surprise to me. After that, a lot of things changed. We had paper drives where you'd, you, on a designated day, They'd come around on every street in town and pick up all of the newspapers that you would save. Newspapers were important in the production of ammunition. We also had uh, lard, L-A-R-D drives, because lard was a very important thing in the manufacture of, of arms, of ammunition. We had scrap metal drives. That's, you can imagine what that was. Anything that was lying around the house. And sometimes they would have an aluminum drive, not very often, but women would give aluminum pots, you know, that were still good because this was a, a war effort. Uh, clothing was all sparse. Uh, you got basic things. We didn't know what a hoodie was. That wasn't even invented uh, in those days. Uh, but we, we had enough clothing, but you couldn't go to, as an example, J.C. Penney and expect to find a suit on the rack that would fit you. Uh, they, they just didn't have them. Uh, there were, oh, uh, Let's see. I think we had, I think we had some old clothing drives, but I, I'm not. That's not clear in my mind. I'm, I don't know. But I remember all of the other drives, 
and they usually used the Boy Scouts to help with that, to run to the curb, you know, from the curb to the truck or whatever you were, you were using to gather it. <coughs> I, I used to enjoy that, you know. You were a big shot. You, you got to do that. Otherwise, you stay off the street. <laughs> uh, let's see, what else do I remember? Oh, food items. Oh, something that you ladies would be interested in. We didn't have nylon hose for women, but we had silk holes. I think they were rayon, I don't know. And they all were sewed together right up the center of the, of the back of the leg. And if a store had uh, any uh, stockings, women's stockings, women would flock to that store, like pennies or models or a, a variety of stores. Uh, never would, there would never be enough. Maybe a store would get 12 pair and there'd be 100 women wanting those 12 pair. Oh, it was, that was a, that was a big thing for women. They had to have, not had to have uh, silk holes. You know. uh, what else do I remember about clothing? Not, not much. Uh, there was nothing fancy. If you had a heavy winter coat, it was all, it was wool and it had a collar and that was it. You didn't, you didn't have anything that looked nice, you know. It was just utilitarian, if you use, if I can use the word. Uh, I think that's all right now that comes to my mind about uh, what we were limited to do. How did like regular life change when the war started? Uh, for, for, how did life change for families? Yeah, like, how did life change overall? Well. Uh, the biggest change in our family is that the shoe factory needed all of the workers they could get. And so they hired women. Uh, before, they, they hired women prior to that, but women did uh, women's job, work, you know, not, not heavy work. Now women were asked to do the work that, some, that men did. And my mother went to work at the shoe factory. My youngest sister, I think, was about a year and a half old at the time. And that changed our family life dramatically because mom worked from seven o'clock in the morning until 3.30 or four in the afternoon. And then she had all of the work to do at home. And and moms still have to do the same work. A lot of, most mothers work today. And that was the biggest change for us. Mom and dad were, uh, they were always busy. I can't recall that my, uh, my dad ever uh, attended things at school that he, he, you'd expect him to. I remember distinctly when he went to his first basketball game. W Borger was playing Washington High up at the, uh, what street, what is that? Where the office is? Um, Lucas? Blue Jay Drive? No, the old high school. It's Lucas Street. Oh, the old high school. Yeah. Do you know where to, I, ca I can't think of the name of the street. You know where the building is? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that was a little bitty gym, if, you, if you've ever been in there. And my, well, my, it was a Friday night, and my dad came to the game, and my dad came late. And he was short, about five feet seven. And he was, I saw him when he came in, and he was about fourth, the people were lined up about, about fourth deep everywhere. And I saw him trying to see what was going on. And the next thing I saw, he was up on the balcony looking down. And a few minutes later, I looked and he was gone. 
So when the game was over, I went home that night. He was in bed. And I went into his bedroom. I said, Dad, what would you think? Oh, kids running around in their underwear. I don't believe in that. <laughs> and you can imagine, you know, he had he taught he'd seen people play baseball in uniforms, but here we were with uh, like undershirts only colored and, and shorts. He thought we were running around in our underwear. Now, uh, I think that that kind of uh, gets off the track. How did it change life? Uh, it changed our life in the way I described, but in another way. Now my parents had two incomes. They paid off their home. They bought their home, the one that I grew up in, in 1927 for $4,000, a story and a half frame house with a garage. Um, in 1940, Two, when my mother went to work in a shoe factory, uh, they, they still owed $2,000 on that house. Well, with my mother's income, they paid that off. And shortly after that, we had a, uh, prior to the war and during the war, we had a 1927 Chevrolet. Beautiful automobile. <laughs> And after my mother worked, then my dad bought a different car, a newer car. I never did like that one as well as the old one. But that's another story. Uh, so economically, there was a, uh, uh, an improvement in our uh, situation at home. That doesn't mean that there was a lot of money, but at least bills were paid and things were improved. We got a refrigerator after the war. We didn't have that before. We got a, an electric stove, no, gas stove, gas stove. Uh, prior to that, we had a, a coal oil stove, coal oil burner. Uh, I can still smell that, you know, every time mom would light the stove, I can still smell that coal oil burning in the house. Uh, well, things just were, economically, were better for us at that time, from our, uh, from my family, from my parents, and for, I had, I had two brothers and two sisters, and uh, uh, they were all younger. I, I'm the oldest of of the family. Okay, any more? Were people treated differently because of their race or heritage during the war? Uh, Were people treated differently because of their race or heritage here in this area? Uh, well, uh, I grew up on High Street, one block from the city park. Summer times, when we were young, we'd spend the entire day in the city park. But better be home in time for lunch, better be home in time for dinner, or trouble. At any rate, uh, there were, there were uh, Negroes, that's what they were called, that lived down on Front Street the Stevens family, the Burles, uh, and a few others. I grew up with Bill Stevens. He's my age. He's now deceased. We were friends, and, and I knew that Bill was different, that he was a, a Negro. He wasn't, they didn't call him black American, uh, African Americans then. Uh, and yes, those people were discriminated against. They were not allowed to go to the school. Uh, they had a school, a grade school, uh, on the west end of, of Washington. Uh, they did not have a high school, so 
if they wanted to go to high school, they had to go into St. Louis, which a few of them did, not many. But uh, uh, yes, there was this racial discrimination, very much so. Uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't an angry type discrimination. Uh, it seemed like we all knew our place, if you know what I'm saying. And, and that sounds horrible because the Negroes were definitely lower, low, they didn't get the opportunities. The jobs weren't there for them. Bill Stevens spent his life uh, as a janitor at the post office. And uh, uh, I saw him every day and almost every day. And, and he was a, a close friend that, until the day he died. Uh, they, well, Walter, Walter uh, Burrow was an, a mechanic at Modern Auto. And two other uh, black men were uh, employees at Modern Auto, but there weren't very many places that the blacks uh, had an opportunity to work. It, was, it wasn't nice. Uh, but then, bear in mind, we didn't know any better, or we didn't, we didn't think about other, how limited their opportunities were. I didn't. And I was always happy when, or I was happy when Bill got that job at the post office, uh, because I don't know what he would have done if he hadn't gotten that job. Now, he had two older brothers. Uh, one went to St. Louis, and one, I don't know really what he did. George, I, I really don't know what, what he did. He didn't. He didn't do a whole lot because uh, you'd see him around town a lot. So now, uh, any any bias or anything? There was no no real bias as far as I'm concerned between the students at uh, Borgia and the students at Washington High. We knew everybody. We, the schools were much smaller. When I graduated in 1946, senior class was 46. That's how many we had. And it was boys and girls. So uh, there may have been bias, but I wasn't aware of it. Now, I, I respected uh, my neighbors on both sides were not Catholic, and, uh, and I, I respected the church that he went to and respected the minister when I'd see him, but uh, there was, I can't say that it was biased. I'm sure that we associated with people of like religions more than the opposite, but that's, that was just the way it was. What did you do for entertainment during the war? Good question. Uh, of course, we had uh, school activities, basketball, uh, softball, baseball, uh, no football, uh, no soccer. We didn't even know what that was. Uh, I guess that's, those are the only, oh, the girls had volleyball. They didn't play f basketball. In those days, girls' basketball was a different game. There were six players on each team, and three girls could bring the ball up to the middle of the f court, but then they had to pass it to the three forwards. So it was kind of a slow, ho-hum game. I didn't, I didn't care for watching girls' basketball, but we had the sports in season, 
uh, we had the, the movie theater. And of course, uh, we, we were always interested in the movie tone news. That was, uh, well, it was a report on what was import going on in the world. And, and we'd get reports of what was going on in the war. But it was, all, it was always, uh, I guess you'd call it, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, somebody would censor, censor it, that's it. And we never saw Americans being shot to pieces or anything like that. As an example, my mother-in-law had five sons in the war and if she would have been able to turn on the, t they didn't have TV either, but if she would have been able to turn on a TV and see war as it was at that very minute, you know, on, on TV, I'm sure she would have gone crazy. Uh, one of her sons lost his hearing. Uh, one of her uh, sons was, uh, had a, was a, in a tank and had a very, traumatic experience of his, his friend opened the, the lid on the tank and stood up and got shot right between the eyes and he dropped back down. And, you know, those are traumatic experiences. And uh, so they didn't show that kind of thing. They would show distances, Americans moving forward or uh, they would show some uh, air battles, uh, fighter planes, and you'd see, we'd never see an American plane go down. We'd always see Germans or Japanese. It was, it was censored, and so uh, movies were uplifting. In those days, you walked out of a movie theater, you smiled, because they always had a good ending. The first movie I saw that I, I thought was horrible was uh, a, uh, oh, I can't even remember the name of it now, but, uh, it was a, the Mafia movie. And, and I, it was a full house at the theater and people were coming out, boy, they looked very somber and I couldn't understand that. But after I watched the movie, I came out looking very somber too, because it was very depressing. Uh, let's see, I, my memory is failing me, but uh, there were big stars in the movie, and now, now I don't go to movies. I don't want to come away feeling bad. I got off the track, but it's movies. Fun. Oh, I forgot one other thing. We had dances. City Park. Now, if if you can imagine this, you know the the pavilion, the dance pavilion, the open air pavilion. If you can imagine that, absolutely so crowded with dancers that you couldn't hardly turn around without bumping into someone. That was the way the dances would attract people. And you'd look out in the, on the parking lot and maybe there'd be a half a dozen or 10 automobiles. Everybody else walked. People would walk. And there were dances quite frequently on Friday nights very rarely on Saturday nights, and always on Sunday night. We would have a dance at the, at the city park. Winter time, we'd go into the, into the uh, auditorium. Now, these were put on by organizations, and, and we had dance bands, Sunnyside Serenaders, uh, Slenny Lefholz. Uh, there are some of his bands still living. Uh, they were, they were young men in those days, 12, 13 uh, players on the, on the dance band. And uh, 
uh, the, the, the dances were fun. They really were. And they had, at times, they'd have what they called a jitney dance. And you'd go up to a ticket booth and you'd buy five tickets for a quarter or 10 tickets for 50 cents. And then every time you danced, you had to give them a ticket. That was called a jitney dance. It was fun when you don't know any better or any differently. Okay. Did you have a sweetheart during the war? Did you have a sweetheart during the war? Did I have? A sweetheart? Oh, uh, well, see, I was in high school and shy. Oh my, I was as shy as Alex. Uh, I was worse. Uh, I, I thought I was kind of goofy looking. I had about five million freckles. Still got a couple hundred thousand of them. Uh, but uh, no, I did not. Uh, I can remember the first date I had, and I was so nervous about it. We went to the movie that I couldn't get her home fast enough. I, I just, <laughs> nervous, just unsure of myself. But what helped, and this is getting off the track, but what helped me was we started a, a JC club in Washington. And in those days, I don't know how it's operated today, but in those days when you joined, you were immediately placed on a committee. And all committees met at least once a month before the regular meeting. And you had to make the report of that committee that at the next meeting. And that, you know, that gave me courage to stand up in front of someone and say something, even if it was wrong, you know. But uh, uh, the JCs were a great training ground for me. Do you remember VE Day or VJ Day? Oh, both of them. Uh, we were playing in Europe, the war in Europe. We were playing a, a high school softball game at the city park against Pacific High School. And uh, uh, the church bells started to ring and horns were blowing, people driving, horns blowing. And someone came out to the park and said, the war in Europe is over. The game stopped right there. Pacific got back in their cars and went home. And we did the same thing. Never finished the game. But there was a, a lot of celebrating around town. Of course, when you're a teenager, you don't do much celebrating. If we didn't then. And uh, then VJ Day, when, uh, when that happened, uh, the town went goofy. And they pulled a, a piano out on the corner of Second and Elm. And a man started playing the piano. And people danced in the street practically all night. And there were a few. At that time, there were a few military guys home on leave. And everybody, everybody wanted to talk to them uh, because the war was over. Now, uh, I know that many people didn't uh, celebrate too much because we were prepared to go into Japan we had thousands of military, of army people, ready to go into Japan the day of the signing because there was a danger that the Japanese people would not accept the fact that the war was over. And that was not true because the, the, the uh, civilian population followed the wishes of the emperor 
who stopped the war. Now, the military, the Japanese military, the higher, at the higher level, did not want it to stop the war. They did not want him to declare a surrender. And they almost pulled it off. So there were a lot of people that knew uh, about these things. And, and we were told that we, ne we shouldn't get too excited until all of this had settled down because there might be more casualties when the troops went, went ashore. One of my brothers-in-law was in that group and he said they went in just as if they were invading the place uh, because they were afraid they were going to be shot at. But he wasn't. Does that answer the question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. You guys have any replacements? 20 minutes. What? Just 20 minutes. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Did you keep in touch with friends during the war that were stationed over? Uh, I'd like to say that I wrote to my cousins or friends. I didn't. Now, uh, I think I told you about what my cousins did. It's hard to get the layup. Uh, what the, my cousins did when they came home. Well, I saw how important it was. So when my sons went off, the older, the older three or boys, uh, went off to, the, uh, to school, I wrote to them, well, I would write several times a week to the oldest one, and to the youngest one, I would write probably four or five times a week, because I knew how important it was. Uh, one of my daughters-in-law, who was then dating my, one of my sons, said, she called me Pops. She says, Pops, why don't you write to me? She says, you write to Pete. She says, my mom calls me once a week, but I don't never get a letter. So I started writing on no carbon required paper, dear Pete and Judy. The next day I'd write dear Judy and Pete and I'd send them uh, letters. To this day, every Saturday I write what I call the Weekend Gazette to 34 people. They are nieces and nephews and grandchildren who are out of the Washington area and friends. And one man I write to, our friendship goes back to 1942. And uh, I hear from him every week and I, I do that uh, gazette on Saturday. And just last Friday, one of my nephews from uh, Phoenix, Arizona, he came to Washington to, for Mother's Day and he came uh, to see me to thank me for the gazette. So I know how, how important it is to keep in touch with your relatives. Now it's easier with email, uh, fax, but, uh, and, that, and I use email today. Uh, two years ago, way back, I would write, print them out, uh, and each, in, I would individualize each greeting and then change whatever needed to be changed in the first paragraph, but that took a lot of time, and when stamps got up to 40 cents, I thought, mm, I'll take advantage of email. And that works out fine. I write to, I write to one who is in Afghanistan, and one is in Spain, uh, so all over. Uh, but I didn't do that during, during the war. 
not very happy about that, but I just didn't think about it. Didn't think it was important. Besides that, I was, I was busy. I was either working, studying, or going to, or, uh, going to school. Uh, school was not that easy, so I had to do some working to keep up with it. And, and, and I did. Okay. I think we need to wrap up here, but do you have anything else that you would like to share with us? Well, uh, regarding the war, you talk yeah, or anything. Or anything? Yeah. Oh, gee, now you <laughs> open up a Pandora's box. Uh, the important things in life are not what kind of a car you drive. It's not what kind of clothes you wear. It's how you treat other people. And you, you, must, you must keep in mind that even though people don't think your way, they have a right to their opinions. And I don't know that I can say that I was, boy, I want to learn as much as I can. I did. I did but I didn't go out of my way. I, I read a lot, and I still read a lot. I loved to read about the Civil War. Uh, not that the, it's such a great period in our history, but uh, it's fascinating to me that the South challenged the North and didn't have one single plant in the entire South that could make copper, could handle copper in, and uh, brass. Now, that's absolutely imperative with guns to have that. So they, they had to import that. And why the South thought they could win a war. I think somebody says it's time to stop. Uh, oh, uh, uh, all I can say is. Alan Stark, please come to the Northampton lobby. Alan Stark. Be, be conscious of other people around you and, and, and their needs. Everybody needs to be accepted. Well, thank you so thank much. Thank you, sir. Oh.